Hello there. Today, we're looking at A Path Towards Autonomous Machine Intelligence by Jan Lacan, also called the JEPA paper. Actually, I think only I call it the JEPA paper. But JEPA is a new architecture that Jan Lacan proposes as a part of this paper, and we're going to go into it, as he himself describes it as the corner piece of this method. So you will learn what one of the godfathers and Turing Award winners thinks of how we should reach machine intelligence, or at least one proposal of it. The abstract reads, how could machines learn as efficiently as humans and animals? How could machines learn to reason and plan? How could machines learn representations of percepts and action plans at multiple levels of abstraction, enabling them to reason, predict, and plan at multiple time horizons? These things are largely all open problems in current deep learning, uh, efficient learning especially. Deep learning is notoriously data hungry. Uh, reasoning and planning is something that a lot of these things can't do, at least, according to some people. And uh, certainly reasoning, predicting, planning at multiple time horizons, these kind of things, including abstraction, all of these things are still sort of out of the realm of current deep learning. So here is Jan Lacan's uh, position paper, as he calls it, of how to reach these things. So he also says the text is written with as little jargon as possible and using as little mathematical prior knowledge as possible, so as to appeal to readers with a, a wide variety of backgrounds. Now, I don't want to actually go through the whole paper because the whole paper is what 69 pages long or so, but I'll present to you sort of the core piece, which is the JEPA architecture, and just a little bit around that so you know what's going on. And I think it's pretty cool. Uh, here he states the main contributions of the paper are the following. First, an overall cognitive architecture in which all modules are differentiable and many of them are trainable. This is going to be one of the more wishy-washy, hand-wavy pieces of the paper. We'll quickly look at it. Then, JEPA and hierarchical JEPA, a non-generative architecture for predictive world models that learn a hierarchy of representations. So there should immediately, you should see that you have a non-generative architecture, but for predictive world models, which is going to be interesting. How can you be non-generative yet still predict stuff? We're going to see that in fact, the predictions happen in the latent space, kind of like mu zero, if you will. Third, a non-contrastive, non-contrastive self-supervised learning paradigm that produces representations that are simultaneously informative and predictable. And the key thing here is going to be this non-contrastive part. Uh, Lacan makes a big deal out of the, out of uh, pitching, essentially pitting contrastive and non-contrastive methods and arguing why non-contrastive methods should be preferred above contrastive methods, mostly due to the curse of dimensionality. Lastly, a way to use HJEPA at the basis of predictive world models for hierarchical planning under uncertainty. So the H here is going to be for the hierarchical extension or the hierarchical, hierarchical arrangement of the JEPA architecture. He says, impatient readers may prefer to jump directly to the aforementioned sections. We'll do exactly that. <laughs> so there is a bit about world models and, and why it's important. And here is kind of the entire proposed architecture. Now, as I said, this is a little bit hand wavy. Uh, so there is essentially a world model, which is, you know, pretty important. And that's going to be the centerpiece right here that predicts the state of the world forward in time. So this is the actual world. And the world model is trying to predict that it's going to interact with this actor module right here. Obviously, the actor is going to be what actually does the action. However, the actor could also act inside of the world model in sort of a simulated reality and, and plan forward what would happen if I were to do something, or it could interact with the world model to find the best action to do. And that's exactly what we're going to see. The short term memory here is going to be used to train that world model and also to train that critic. So it's essentially the things that happen in the world are going to be stored into the short term memory. And then the critic can be updated from that, but will not look into that very well, very much. Perception module right here is a module that takes the whatever the world gives 
and makes it available as a representation or as a perception. This is going to be the let's say the entry point to the systems that we have. And this is very much the closest that we have to something that's actually working, which is obviously our current deep learning systems, they're very good at perception. So there is one thing I've left out, which is this configurator thing right here, the configurator is sort of the master module that configures all the other modules, uh, depending on what situation they're in and so on. And this is is definitely like there's a lot of hand waving right here. It's like, yeah, yeah, we can just have like a top down configurator that configures stuff. And I don't want to, I don't want to go too much into it because there's not too much to go into, but also it's not the core of the paper. We're going to go, what well, we're going to go into the world model here specifically. So, First of all, he describes a two different ways of let's say acting in the world. And here we are for the first time introduced to kind of like the notation of this paper, which is very much in diagrams. Uh, so this is what he calls a mode one perception action episode. This goes very much uh, with like Kahneman, I believe it was Kahneman like mode one and mode two reasoning or thinking. So mode one is sort of reactive, you simply go from perception of the world to action without much thought. Uh, it's, it's kind of subconscious. And this is encapsulated here. So we start with the world, we get like some sort of so sort of observation, we put this through the encoder right here, that's going to give us a latent representation. This encoder is that that perception perception module that we saw before. Now, uh, different things happen, but only actually one path is critical. Namely, this goes to the actor right here. This is the actor. And the actor sends back an action to the world. As you can see, this is a straightforward uh, signal routing to the actor and back. Oh, it even says actor right here. Um, it says even this reactive process does not make use of the world model nor the cost. So there is a cost module that we saw, which tells sort of how much something is, whether it's good or bad, this can be intrinsic motivation, this can be external reward, anything like this, we can compute it. However, in this very basic loop, the actor has been trained already to just act on a percept. At inference time, the actor doesn't need to look at the cost anymore in order to act. This is what we're very used to from current, like uh, model free reinforcement learning algorithms, they simply train the actor using the reward. But then once it's inference time, they simply let the actor act and rely on that training. This is one of this is a mode one perception action episode. In contrast to that, uh, we are introduced to the mode two perception action episode. This is a little bit more involved. You can see here that we are rolling out the world model forward in order to do something. And what do we do? Again, we have an input here, we go through the encoder, this is probably a wrong color as it's the same. Uh, we go through the encoder. However, now we are going to roll out the world model across different time steps. And how are we going to roll out the world model, we're going to use the actor right here. So the actor is going to take that state it gets from the encoder and propose an action. This is the same actor as before. It's just sort of a trained thing that's proposing some action. Okay, good enough, we can use that into the world model together with the latent prediction, you realize right here, the predictor here, this thing, it takes whatever comes out of the encoder right here. That means it takes a latent state of the world, and it predicts the next latent state of the world. That's why he calls this non generative. Uh, these these world models and and these encoders, they all go to latent space, and then they predict stuff in latent space. So in fact, it doesn't predict the world, it predicts the latent state of the world, which enables it to focus on what's truly important for the task, obviously, modulo how well you can train this thing uh, to, to actually do that, and how you can prevent it from collapse, we'll get to all of that. Uh, however, you've, you'll notice that now we can give the actor the representation, it proposes an action, we can uh, actually use the world model to predict the next state. 
from that next state. We can ask the actor for an action. The actor gives us an action and we can predict the next state. Now, what does that give us? In fact, that gives us quite a bit. Let's, let's assume, let's just assume that episodes are always the same length and forget about this, forget about this, forget about this. Episodes are always the same length, this length right here. And you won't get any reward or anything or any intrinsic reward until the very end. Like until the very end, there's kind of like a, a reward or a cost or something like this. Well, we can compute it, which is fine. We could already do that before. It's informative, but we didn't do anything with it. However, once we have that whole loop done, if all of these things are differentiable, what we can do is we can say, well, this action sequence right here, right now would give us like a reward of five, okay? Can we make that bigger? Well, since everything's differentiable, I can certainly use backpropagation and gradient descent to ask how would this action need to change in order to make this thing go higher, right? Oh, maybe I need to switch to a different action. Now it's six. Well, can I also change that action to make it go higher? Oh, well, I can. Now it's seven and so on. So I can modify, I can optimize all of these actions at inference time using gradient descent, right? This is, if this is not familiar to you, it's kind of the same as if you construct an adversarial example to an image classifier. That's also gradient descent at inference time. So here gradient descent isn't used to train any of these modules. We assume that training is done. Gradient descent is used in order to improve this initial action sequence to a more optimal set of actions. And we do that, you know, we improve these actions here. We're using gradient descent through all these modules until we have completely optimized the action sequence. And which means that this very first action is probably a very good action, like hopefully a better action than was first proposed by the naive actor. And then we can take that action and feed it to the world as an action. So this is mode two uh, perception action episode. This is kind of the model thinking about the future and figuring out through forward looking, what do I need to do? What do I need to change to improve the outcome? Uh, how can I how can I make stuff better? And that necessarily uses this world model, right? Um, and obviously this is just more general if you include all of these costs, which you can have after every step, uh, you can include uh, some kind of discount factors and yada, yada, yada. Um, yeah, so inference time optimization isn't new, but it is sort of how Lacan sees uh, a way, one way, of how to make these things plan forward. So the text says, through an optimization or search procedure, the actor infers a sequence of actions that minimizes the total energy. So these things are called energy. And note that it doesn't necessarily need to be optimization. It could also be search. It could be evolutionary search. It could be tree search. Uh, anything that actually tries to improve the action sequence at inference time. An instance of classical model predictive control. This is an instance of classical model predictive control with reseeding horizon planning. All right. And this here is how we would train such a thing. So not such a thing, sorry. Let's assume that we have the two modes. We have this naive actor and we use the naive actor to propose sequences for the uh, longer like for, for this thing, right? We propose that first sequence using the naive, act, naive actor. In mode one, mode two language, there is such a thing as if you do something often and you do it consciously, at some point it becomes subconscious, right? Like muscle memory or something like this. Well, how could this work? This is how this could work in this framework. So you'd have uh, essentially these actions right here are the ones that we have come up through this whole planning process, through this whole optimization process. Well, what you can do is you can simply ask the actor or take that output from the initial actor 
and then you can try to make these things as close as possible, right? You have all the things right here, everything's differentiable. So you can train the actor to essentially match those better actions. Because you know, the actor would propose one action. However, this other action you found to be superior using your world model. Now, obviously, that requires you to have a good world model. But if you have that, then you can improve this low level actor. And at some point, that initial action sequence that it proposes will already be close to optimal. It's kind of an approximation that you distill into this actor. So this is the first introduction to the system right here. We're going to look a little bit more uh, into how these systems should actually work. And here starts a discussion of two things. The first one is self-supervised learning. And the second one is energy based models. The first one is sort of a training paradigm of how to train models uh, using unsupervised data. The second one is, I want to say, a way of, of thinking about these models. Uh, it's a formulation of a system. And we'll get to it. And th they are connected. So self supervised learning, Lacan sees this in the following terms, I have a piece of data, which is this whole block right here. And I, I try to predict, I try to like mask out the piece, which is this right hand side right here, like I pretend I don't know it. And then I use the thing I do know. And I try to predict the thing I don't know. It's not exactly that. However, in fact, what I want to do is I don't want to predict the thing I don't know, I want to create this thing called an energy function, an energy function tells me how well these two things fit together. And this is going to become clearer in just a second. But the way it's formulated right here is that to capture the dependencies between the observed parts of the input, and possibly unobserved parts of the input. So this uh, is supposed to, well, it's gonna, as I said, it's gonna get clearer in just one second. But what you want to do is you want to train a system that sees the data space in this format right here, which is going to be a so called energy landscape. So if you have imagine this is a video sequence right here. So there is a bunch of frames, and a bunch of frames and frames, 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 right here. So if you have this energy landscape right here, you're trying to relate first, like the start of a video sequence to the end of a video sequence. You can imagine this in a very high dimensional space, essentially, where um, all the frames here are concatenated to to a big vector and all the frames here as well. And the energy function or the system that you train should assign a very low energy to all of the video sequences that are, let's say, realistic. Or, in other words, here is the x, whenever x is this video sequence, then and y is this video sequence, then the energy function should assign a low energy to that if the two could actually follow one another. So if y could follow x, if y would be a logical continuation of x in video space, the energy function should assign a low value to that. This formulation is very cool, because it means if we don't need to predict y from x directly, because there could be multiple video sequences, right, following that same beginning. And that means if we were to just predict y, then we would tr probably train the system, I mean, we can still do it. But we can probably we would probably train the system to say, no, there is one correct continuation. However, if we train the energy function, the energy function could assign a low value to any possible continuation, as long as it assigns a high value everywhere else, we're good. So we're trying to uh, produce systems that behave like this. Now, I for I used to uh, think energy function and training loss are the same thing. But I know that Jan Lacan is very adamant about the thing that an energy function 
is sometime, something that you minimize at inference time, while the training loss is something that you minimize at training time. Sometimes they are very similar and overlapping. For example, a lot of times uh, the, the um, energy function and the training loss are the same formula. And by training the system, you actually immediately cause it to minimize that energy at inference time, simply by forward passing in the model. However, we can do more with energy functions, which we're going to see right now. Now we introduce latent variable energy-based models. This is the same formulation as before. We have an X and a Y, and we have an energy function that tells us how well those two are compatible with each other, which is going to be this thing right here. However, as we've seen, there could be many y that are possible for a given x, right? So just by seeing x, we can't tell, you know, which of the y's is, is compatible. And that's why we introduce a latent variable z. So this z right here is going to capture all the information about y that isn't directly in x. For example, if we have a video of some, some car, right, the car... Ah, no, obviously, <laughs> we have the tracks, and they split right here. And they go right here. And there's a bunch of people and there is a person. So the trolley car problem, if we have the trolley car problem, and it goes down, this is the video sequence is up to here, right? And we don't know how the lever is, this is hidden from us. There are two possible continuations, one here, one here. The We can't tell just from x, x is here, and y is the continuation. So the variable z, we introduce it to capture that information. In this case, the variable z is either left or right, it's binary variable. And in order, if we have an x and we have a y, in order to compute that energy that tells us how well the two are compatible, we need to minimize over z. So what we need to do is if we have a particular y, let's say we actually have the y where the cart goes here, right? So it goes on the lower track. We ask how well do these two video sequences follow from one another? Well, the answer is they follow very well from one another because certainly the card going here is one possible continuation. And that means that um, we had to search over all the possible futures, which means we had to minimize over Z. So we considered Z going up or Z being down and we determined the Z being down leads to the lower energy and that is in fact a very low energy. Now what happens if we actually input a video sequence that isn't, um, that isn't, let's say we input a video sequence instead of this. So the cart is here, it goes here. And then the next video sequence is of, I don't know, like a Teletubby. So there's a Teletubby. It's a sequence like, it's an episode from Teletubbies. Right? So these two things don't follow from one another. And again, we do the same thing. We minimize over Z, uh, but no matter whether we think the lever is up or down uh, as the minecart approaches, it never, it's never a good continuation that there is, that follow the next frames or an episode of Teletubbies. So that's how you think about latent variable energy-based models is that there's a hidden variable. The hidden variable captures everything that is sort of not captured in X about Y, and we minimize over that latent variable to get the actual energy, which means we're looking for the, the value of the latent variable that is most, that makes X and Y most compatible. And yeah, so this is also going to be quite powerful, which means that if we already know that X and Y are compatible with one another, then minimizing over Z, if we have a, a good energy function, minimizing over Z could actually tell us something about the latent structure of the world. So we could infer Z, or if we have this model trained, then if we have an X, um, 
we could actually sample some z values in order to maybe produce different future or, or different possibilities of y. This gives us a lot of freedom to handle uncertainty in the world or simply unobserved structure in the world. Now there is a problem with these types of architecture and that is going to be collapse. Uh, if you've noticed that we simply introduced this variable z right here and we said well it contains everything that's not contained in x but there's actually no restriction for that. Uh, the, if we train this model just with, let's say, gradient descent and some loss and we'll make all of these variables unrestricted, then very quickly uh, the, like, the, the model will become basically useless because let's say our loss function is um, how well we can predict from x and z how well we can predict y, right? That's the general form. Now, we minimize over we minimize over the values of z, which means that if we simply set z equals to y, we can always perfectly predict y. And that means x just becomes completely useless. And the prediction function just becomes the identity function. This is known as collapse and we don't want it. Uh, what we want to do is restrict z, for example, so that, like here, it can only take two particular values, while x and y are sequences of video frames, uh, so that that doesn't happen. Or we can do it with some architectures. So let's look at different configurations right here of these energy-based models. In any case, d here is the d is the energy or the uh, compatibility function. What if we have a deterministic encoder that gives us the latent representation of x, and then we use a predictor module in order to predict y. So we'll just predict y directly, and then compare it with the true y, and then we have a loss in between them. This cannot collapse uh, because, well, um, we need to predict the actual y. <laughs> now let's introduce one of these latent variables and we're in exactly the situation that I just described. Again, we compute the representation for x, but we'll introduce this z that can vary over a certain domain, which gives us a, vary, a domain that um, we can control for the output of this predictor right here. If we now try to predict y from z and x, we can, as I said, just set z to y, and we'd always be good, so this can collapse. What about this thing right here, uh, the autoencoder? This seems, oh, this is just the same as the first architecture. Um, <laughs> this is the same as the first architecture, except just y goes in. So instead of x and y, we just have y, goes through an encoder, gets a latent representation, goes through a decoder that uh, gives you back the, um, gives you back an estimation of oneself. And as you know, an autoencoder, if you don't restrict it somehow in the middle here, then it can just become the identity function again and be useless. And the last one is this joint embedding architecture. Now this is looks or sounds an awful lot like the thing that the paper is describing. And as you can see, it can in fact collapse. So we're going to have an encoder for X and an encoder for Y. These could be the same, but don't have to be. They're going to give us two latent representations, but, or then we use an energy function to compute how well these two latent representations fit together, maybe with the help of a latent variable. Now, if, the encoders right here simply always output the a constant vector and this one does too and the constant vector is in fact the same constant vector then we're always good right we always output the same vector and this cost function up here will always say yeah they're completely equal this is completely cool they match together super well so this can definitely collapse and we need to do something against it this is a um, the main discussion here that leads us into contrastive versus 
restrictive or regularized architectures. And this is going to lead us to the uh, JIA architecture. <laughs> now, it's going to be JEPA, but we're building it up slowly. So how do we design the loss to prevent collapse? Now, remember where we are, we started with self super with, with we started with recognizing that self supervised learning is probably a good thing, because we can do it without labels, right? Uh, we can handle multiple domains with this. All we need to do is we need to pretend to not know some part of the input and use the other part to predict something about that unknown part. We then said, okay, we want to formulate this as an energy based model, where we'll obtain a model that assigns a low energy to all the compatible pairs of inputs and a high energy to all the incompatible pairs of inputs. And that means at inference time, we can do a lot of things, for example, minimize that energy in order to find pairs that go really well together. Or if we have a pair, we can, um, we can look at the energy and judge how well that fits. For example, you could interpret something like clip as an a, a simple energy based model that simply computes at inference time that energy. And if you view these uh, VQGAN plus clip optimization procedures that were really cool before Dali was or mini Dali was open sourced, um, then this is exactly minimizing an energy at inference time. So just so you can imagine something below it, we then introduced uh, latent variables into the mix saying, well, for a given beginning of a video, for example, there's going to be multiple continuations. And this could be captured in a latent variable, this could also be for a given left side of the picture, there can be multiple right hand sides and so on. Um, this can be captured in latent variables, and to compute the energy we need to minimize. We then discovered that this is probably prone to a thing called collapse, uh, among other things, other architectures like other aspects of this architecture are also prone to collapse. And now we need to do something against it. And there are two ways of doing something against it. There is contrastive training, or regularization. Now contrastive training, you might be aware of that. So on the left hand side, you have the situation of like a half trained system. So this half trained system already has some training examples that have a relatively low energy, but there are still some that have a high energy. So training means that at the end, we want to end up with a model that assigns a low energy to certainly all the training examples and some space around it. So we want the energy at the low energy region to extend to these training examples, and maybe cut out a bit from that middle right here, push the energy up a little bit to say, well, actually, these samples in that space are not compatible with one another. So contrastive methods are very, very classic method. Um, I don't actually know if clip is trained as a contrastive method, but many, many sort of of these um, image, uh, image, or self supervised image training procedures are certainly contrastive. What they'll do is they'll have an image, they are going to make two variations of that image, maybe by random cropping and data augmentation and so on. Then they'll take another image, like a third image from the database, and they're going to make also a variation of that. And then they use the embedding models uh, to embed all of those. I'm already so embed, embed, embed this into latent space. So this here would be your standard ResNet encoder or something like this. Uh, this is usually used in image pre training, right? And Oh, no. Yeah. So this will give you a data point somewhere in high dimensional space. And then what you do is you try to pull the two that are from the same image together, and you push the ones that are from different images apart. Right? This is contrastive training, and it relies on you coming up with these negative samples. So what you want to do is you want to create these contrastive samples that you just kind of jiggle the data points around a bit that you have in with um, using either augmentations or 
just some sort of distortions and so on. Now, um, what we've done right here is we've chosen random negatives, but we could also actually mine hard negatives that are uh, very close to the training data. However, this quickly runs into problems. As you know, there's the curse of dimensionality. If you have a data point and you want to wiggle it into different directions, those directions increase exponentially as you go up in dimensions. So this whole approach of finding training examples or finding negative examples around a training example to do the contrastive training is getting less and less tenable in the higher you go with the dimensions. And therefore, Jan Lecun advertises for something different, which he calls regularized methods. Now, regularized methods have other means of restricting that space um, that is low, a low energy region. So there is no, there are no constructed data points outside here that, you know, make the energy high here and low here. But um, there is a natural tendency of the system, like obviously you enforce, you enforce the system, you encourage the system to keep the region where the energy is low, very small. And this is done through regularization. And we'll see how um, this is done in this joint embedding predictive architecture. So this is the basic module. Uh, we've already seen it. This was the thing before that was, um, no, almost, almost. So this is almost the same as before. But again, we have our X and our Y, uh, two points that we want to check if they're compatible with one another. We'll embed both of them using deterministic encoders. This gives us latent representations of X and Y. So X could be the last state of the world. Y could be the next state of the world. So we map these to the latent representations. Then we'll use this predictor right here to predict the latent representation of Y from the latent representation of X. Okay, This is uh, the, an important part here that differentiates us from before. Before we try to predict Y directly, now we try to predict the latent representation of Y from X. We're going to make use of a latent variable right here. I guess this is optional, but uh, it's built into this model right here. So this controls which Y or which latent representation we're getting. So Z can vary over this domain right here, which then leads the S of Y, this thing here, to vary over this squiggly domain right here. So this probably means that uh, Z could vary over a relatively simple domain, but through the power of neural networks, this is going to be transformed into some complicated manifold. Like, as I said, does the car, car turn left or right gives rise to an, in, to an entirely different uh, series of video frames. And this is then going into the energy function, uh, whether or not the representation of Y is compatible with the predicted representation of Y. Now, since we are actually trying to predict the representation, this energy function right here is probably very simple, like something like a cosine distance or an L2 distance or something like this that actually makes the representations equal. Energies can be much more uh, complicated, but yeah. So here he repeats the main advantage of JEPA is that it performs predictions in representation space, eschewing the need to predict every detail of Y and enabling an elimination of irrelevant details by the encoders. Obviously, that's also a thing that's going to be subject to collapse. So he says, you know, these encoders, they could just throw away everything that's not relevant about X and Y, because we never need to predict Y directly from something in here, right? We don't do that. So we can just forget about stuff that is not important. Now, how, why aren't we forgetting about all the stuff? And here is where this regularization comes in. So how to train a model like this? Well, first of all, we obviously train it by minimizing this predictive error right here. This is the basis, right? We actually want to predict the latent representation of Y from this thing, or sorry, from the latent representation of X, right? We want to predict this thing. We actually need to compute 
the loss between these two things. That's exactly this D function right here. This is the core, right? This is unchanged from before. However, we have a couple of regularizers here to prevent collapse. First of all, we regularize Z, this thing right here. What, what do we do? We minimize the information content of Z. And that means as before, we said, well, if we let Z just be anything that we want, uh, given that we minimize over Z at inference time, uh, this Z can just become equal to Y and make D be zero all the time. So this is not good. So we need to minimize, we need to regularize Z. Before I said Z could just capture the state of the lever, left or right, right? Then, you know, there is so much more information in the latent representation of the future video frames uh, that Z cannot possibly, even if we minimize over this binary variable, cannot possibly capture all of that. So restricting the domain of Z is certainly a way to regularize it. We can also, I guess, classically regularize it with some L2 regularization. We could quantize it. We could uh, sp apply sparsity regularization. Anything like this that limits uh, Z, this latent variable that we minimize over, is needed right here to prevent collapse. The other things that are needed are the things that you see right here. So these are regularizers on the information content of the latent representation. So what we want to do is we maximize the information content that the latent representation of the encoded signal of the encoder perception has about that, um, about that variable itself. Well, I guess it doesn't need to be actually about that variable. It simply needs, it simply means we need to maximize the information content of that variable. Um, how are we going to achieve that? There are also various ways of maximizing the information content. Essentially, it just means that if that variable always has the same value, it doesn't have much information inside of it. So what we can do, for example, we can use a mini batch approach and have many x right here, x, x1, x2, x3, x4, right? And these, if these are all independent, we encode all of them, we get a mini batch of latent representations, and we can do something like we say, well, all of these need to be different, right? And they're, for example, they're, covariance matrices must be identity or something like this. So there are various ways and a lot of Jan Lecca also points to some papers, for example, uh, Vic Reg and Barlow twins that have already or can be framed in ways like this. But this is a general framework. Minimize the information content of the latent variable and maximize the information content of the encoded signals, which makes sure that there isn't a collapse. This directly counteracts that. Down here, I believe, yeah, exactly. We have Vic Reg as a system. So uh, direct implementations of this, you can see right here, the L2 loss between the representations, the regularization here. I don't exactly know how that's regularized. Doesn't say here, but then the maximizing of the information content here is, or here of this thing is done um, via, via regularizing the covariance matrix right here. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the last thing that he says here is that we could also bias JEPA to learn useful representations, saying, it would be useful to have a way to bias the system towards representations that contain information relevant to a class of tasks. This can be done by adding prediction heads that take uh, the latent representation as an input and are trained to predict variables that are easily derived from the data and known to be relevant to the task. So now we're essentially going into the domain of I don't know, natural language pre-training with, with something like T5 or T0, where you just kind of throw tasks at the system and hope and jo jointly train all the tasks and hope that, you know, it learns latent representations that are kind of useful for language tasks. Uh, Lacan says you could also 
in addition to doing all of this, you could also attach some kind of a prediction head right here, and then have another loss um, from a supervised signal, or maybe a imitation learning in reinforcement learning or something like this. Uh, all of this is entirely possible. Because without it, um, without having these heads, right, you now have a system that just sort of does an information trade off, right, it, it just kind of trades off these these different regularizers right here, and tries to get like as much information transmitted through this path here about the latent representation of y, like it tries to, it tries to counteract all of these regularizers, it tries to minimize the information right here, because then it can do a better job, it tries to maximize the information content here, as much as it can, you counteract it via regularization. So you're just kind of playing this information game uh, with the variables right here. And it is up, I would say, to the designers of the system to set the parameters on all of these different loss terms correctly, such that the latent representations are useful. And I also think a big, big, big part here is on the data itself, like the entirety of usefulness without prediction heads of the system is just down to the data, right? If you have data, if you want to learn something about, let's say, uh, different chess positions, like you want to pre train a chess computer with this thing, right, you better input data that has different chess positions uh, that differentiate themselves in the relevant aspects of chess positions. And it's probably not a good idea that you always have the same chess position, but you vary the sort of the shades of gray in the chess board, right. So this thing will sort of learn what is predictable from the data that it gets. So you better make sure that that data, the variation in that data captures what you need to get out of it. Right, so what can we do with this? We can arrange it in a hierarchical fashion. So this is going to lead us to hierarchical JEPA, which is going to be the final the super sane form right here of the model. In fact, if you think about this, going back to the very beginning where we asked ourselves, you know, how could we use a fully differentiable system to plan ahead in time? Well, if you consider this to be, you know, your states of the world, for example, or frames in a video or something like this, you could arrange this system like we did are doing here, uh, to predict over multiple time steps, right? Yeah, as as we do right here. So the lower level predicts over short time frames, while the higher level, you can see uh, over here that this latent representation is in fact obtained from the latent representation of the lower level by a second encoder, and then makes predictions over a longer period of time. So the hierarchical um, arrangement of these things is entirely possible. And we can use that uh, to do hierarchical planning. So this goes back to the very beginning. We at the beginning, we saw how can we do mode two planning, if we have such a world model, right. And now we're going to do this in a hierarchical fashion. So what do we do? Again, say this is the state of the world. And we know at some point, we have a desired outcome, like a cost function or a reward or something like this. Well, if we have trained such a multi layer pre predictive model in latent space, what we can do is we can do what we did at the beginning at this higher level right here. So we're just going to do this thing up here first, which means that we're going to ask this high level actor and we'll, we'll get to what high level actions are, but assume there are high level actions. For example, let's say I need to get to the airport, right? The high level actions are simply, you know, I'm gonna go out of the house, I'm gonna get in the car, I'm gonna drive to the airport, and I'm gonna park the car there. Those are high level actions. And low level actions would be the actual, you know, movements you do. So we can ask this high level actor to give us high level actions. 
we can roll out the world model with it until we are here. We can use backpropagation or search or some other optimization technique in order to refine these actions as well as we can, right? And then we have here targets for these low level actions. Now before these things on the lower level were themselves kind of rewards that we get for, from the world, but this is now up here. And the rewards on the lower level are simply how well we match those um, targets that are given by the higher level. So this, this action, this high level action right here could be get in the car, right? So now get in the car becomes the target. And we can use our lower level planning algorithm uh, in order to determine the best actions, again, using pro proposals, backpropagation, optimization, and so on to get in the car. In fact, we can do it for all of these um, to match all of these higher level actions, which gives us an entire action sequence that would optimally fulfill um, the plan to, to match these higher level actions. And, you know, if we're super duper engaged, we could also optimize all of the different levels together until we have the optimal sequence of lower level and higher level actions in order to reach this goal right here. At that point, we can be relatively sure that this first action right here will serve us just well. And we can actually send that to the world, get the next state and do it all over again. We can even use the short term memory or something like this in order to start at a, a better place for next time already. Although the short term memory here is used to store states in order to train the, the train the loss modules and the critics. Uh, this is if you are actually in an uncertain environment, you could even introduce these latent variables right here, uh, which you can infer. So if you want to reach a certain goal right here, you can infer the latent variables um, also through some sort of optimization procedure, or you can sample the latent variables in order to give you different continuations of your world model up to you and there are various possibilities that open up with these um, with probabilistic world models. But I don't want to go too much into this, I think I hope you get the concept by now of how to think about these things. Again, this, we're again in the space where we have the models trained, and we need to do inference time, inference time decision of what action to take, right? Training this thing is a different game. Training this thing is done via this method. Oh, sorry, this general method uh, by regularizing, um, by minimizing the prediction error in the latent space. Okay, I think that was it for the paper. The rest is about the rest of the architecture, designing and training the actor, data streams, designing the configurator, yeah, this it gets a bit hand wavy at that point. I mainly wanted to bring the um, mainly wanted to bring uh, the 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 Jeppa architecture to you, and you hope you understand that. Uh, yeah, so there's a bit of broader relevance of the proposed approach. Uh, could this architecture be the basis of basis of a model of animal intelligence? Now, it's uh, the answer is maybe, but I found this paragraph here pretty, uh, pretty astounding. The presence of a cost module that drives the behavior of the agent by searching for optimal actions suggests that autonomous intelligent agents of the type proposed here will inevitably possess the equivalent of emotions. Well, that's <laughs> that escalated quickly. Uh, in an analogous way to animal and humans, machine in emotions will be the product of an intrinsic cost or the anticipation of outcomes from a trainable critic cool. Could this be a path towards machine common sense, to which he says, I speculate that common sense may emerge from learning world models that capture the self consistency and mutual dependencies of observations in the world, allowing an agent to fill in missing information and detect violations of its world model. I mean, this isn't entirely possible. Uh, it's, it's certainly like a sense of common sense, like one aspect of common sense. Uh, 
he makes another other few points saying scaling is not enough, mainly criticizing kind of like, you know, can we just scale up GPT-3 in order to get intelligence? Uh, and to which he says, uh, probably not. Uh, reward is not enough, which is sort of a criticism of this thing of, can we just train reinforcement learning like uh, to, 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 you know, can we just train reinforcement learning more and more to reach it? And not only is it sam hor horribly uh, sample inefficient, but also if it lacks a kind of a world model, he also says it's not enough. Yeah, horribly, extremely sample inefficient. So one aspect of the paper is how do we learn more efficiently? Um, do we need symbols for reasoning? This is an interesting question. And he says, maybe, uh, as far as I understand it, he says probably at very high abstraction levels, uh, these sort of latent variables or, or states of the world might become so discontinuous that it's essentially uh, symbolic at that point, um, at which point one could also use kind of like tree search or so instead of a backprop uh, gradient descent. Yeah, like a heuristic search methods, including Monte Carlo tree search or other gradient free methods, since things are so uh, discontinuous. So that is um, it. Uh, a, remain question, a remaining question is whether the type of reasoning proposed here can encompass all forms of reasoning that humans and animals are capable of. And that certainly is the case. So this was the paper again. Uh, the core, con the core suggestion right here is this um, model or these types of models where you have an energy-based model. The energy is kind of like a cost function that you attempt to minimize at inference time. You can use this for planning in an actor by at inference time sort of deciding what actions would maximize that um, uh, reward or minimize that energy or maximize the whatever um, using your world models in latent space, right? You can do this hierarchically by starting with the higher layers and um, the higher determining high level actions, which are essentially targets for the lower levels to match. At any stage, you'll do inference, uh, inference time optimization of the action sequence. All of this can be trained using this uh, arrangement right here, where you do train your predictor and your encoders such that you can very well predict the latent representation of a part of the input, this is self-supervised learning, from another part of the input. However, in order for this model to not collapse, you need to regularize the latent variable and you need to regularize the uh, information content of the uh, latent representations that come out of the encoder. Lastly, uh, yeah, I think I think that was it. Um, I hope you also got the idea behind the difference between contrastive and regularized methods. Contrastive methods sort of try to generate data that is uh, goes well together and generate data that doesn't, um, especially generate these these negatives here. Uh, however, due to the curse of dimensionality, that gets less and less feasible as you go to higher dimensions in your latent representations. On the other hand, regularized methods uh, don't suffer this problem as much. And um, as we saw, a regularizer can be put on any height of, of dimensional variables. Nah, that was the wrong uh, graphic. But uh, JEPA is exactly such a regularized method and does not rely on contrastive training. You can still do it, obviously, but it doesn't, it can be trained without um, because it prevents collapse through regularization. Yeah, I hope also it became clear kind of what an energy function is and how to use latent variables inside of energy functions. And this here, no, this here, still a bit of a mystery how this all should work together. But as I said, it's more of a position paper and a vision 
And I think the JEPO is the core piece of this uh, paper. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, leave a link to the paper. Let me know what you think in the comments. And yeah, I'll see you around. Bye-bye.